Honourable members, dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to warm you warmly, warm, welcome you warmly, sorry, to today's conference on woke, a culture war against Europe. Woke definitely is the new talk of the town in Europe. Now, some of you may ask, what exactly is woke? Well, in just a few years, it exploded onto our social and cultural scene. According to proponents, the ominous talk about woke is exaggerated. It is just another democratization wave, they claim, in order for Europe to strive for true equity. Equity between races, peoples, genders, you name it. But is this really it? Woke has led to an unsurmountable number of strange happenings who are completely uh, normal by the standards of the woke mob. But the whole concept of normality is exactly what woke tries to destroy. That's why, uh, all of a sudden, people start toppling historic statues, including include their gender pronouns, dye their hair in blue, or demand the decolonization of our language and literature. Simply put, the woke mob stirs up unnecessary trouble everywhere they can. Where is this all coming from, you may ask? Woke originated on American uh, college campuses, campuses and is now strongly embedded in academic circles. Other social bodies, such as education, the media and the business world, have also been hugely influenced by woke thinking. The purpose of this conference is to discover the roots of woke. It will be a philosophical search to where woke came from, how it manifests itself, and where it wants to go with our society. The first speaker of the conference will be Dr. James Lindsay from the United States of America. Dr. Lindsay holds a PhD in mathematics and wrote several books about woke, such as race Marxism and cynical theories. Dr. Lindsay is a well-appreciated guest on numerous American venues and talk shows. The second section will deal with the spread of woke in Europe, how it threatens our European civilization and how the educational field and the family are the target. For this, I'm proud to introduce you to Professor Frank Furedi. Professor Furedi is a Hungarian-born British sociology professor. Professor Furedi's research focuses on education, imperialism, and European politics. Professor Furedi runs the Brussels-based think tank, MCC Brussels. The third section of the um, uh, conference will consist of a conversation between Dr. Lindsay and Professor Furedi, moderated by Paul Boniface. Mr. Boniface is a Flemish entrepreneur and author who himself wrote a book about woke. The goal is to have an open conversation. In order to make the panel fully gender inclusive, and by gender I mean male and female, my dear colleague Susanna Ciccardi, which will uh, be arriving soon, uh, one of the most talented members of the European Parliament will deliver the closing remarks. Before starting off uh, and giving the floor to Dr. Lindsay, this conference goes with a disclaimer. So I must warn you, the next two hours, this room will probably not be a very safe space for any purple-haired social justice warriors. But then again, isn't open debate exactly what democracy is all about? Mr. Lindsay, I give you the floor. Hello, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I want to uh, address something Tom just said which is, in fact, that woke is supposed to advance equity in Europe. So here's the definition of equity, and see if it sounds like a definition of anything else you've ever heard of. The definition of equity comes from the public administration literature. It was written by a man named George Fredrickson. 
And the definition is an administered political economy in which shares are adjusted so that citizens are made equal. Does that sound like anything you've heard of before? Like socialism. They're going to administer an economy to make shares equal. The only difference between equity and socialism is the type of property that they redistribute, the type of shares. They're going to redistribute social and cultural capital in addition to economic and material capital. And so this is my thesis when we say what is woke? Woke is Maoism with American characteristics, if I might borrow from Mao himself, who said that his philosophy was Marxism-Leninism with Chinese characteristics, which means woke is Marxism. And it's a very provocative statement. It's something you will certainly hear it is not, that it is different. And the, the, the professors and the philosophers will spend a large amount of time explaining to you why, no, no, it's about economics when it's Marxism. This is social, this is cultural, this is different. It's not different. I need you to think biologically for one moment, and I don't mean about your bodies, we could do that, that's a different topic. I want you to think how we organize plants and animals when we study them. They're species, but above species there are the genus of the animals. So you think like the cats, all the cats, but you have tigers, you have lions, you have house cats, you have whatever, leopards, many different kinds of cats. If we think of Marxism as a genus of ideological thought, then classical economic Marxism is a species. Radical feminism is a species in this same genus. Critical race theory is a genus, or sorry, a species in this genus. Queer theory is a species in this genus. Post-colonial theory that's plaguing Europe is a species in this genus. And they have something that binds them together called intersectionality that makes them treat it as if they are all one thing. But the logic is Marxist, and I want to convince you of that. Because Marx had a very simple proposition, but we get lost. We think that Marx was talking about economics because he often talked about economics. He wrote a book called Capital. It's a very famous book. And we think, well, this is about economic theory. But this isn't true. It, it's only true on the surface. If we go below the surface, what Marx was talking about was something different. We know what Marx's hypothesis was, was that we must seize the means of production if we're going to bring socialism to the nations, to the world. We have to seize the means of production. So we have to ask, what does he mean? And if we think that it's about capital, then we miss what he means. If you think it's about the means of production in the factory with a hammer and the means of production in the field with a sickle, then you miss what it means. Because Marx explained what makes human beings special in his earlier writings. And what makes human beings special is that man is a being that is incomplete and knows that he is incomplete. He is a man whose true nature has been forgotten to him, which is social being. He is a socialist at heart who doesn't realize it. And the reason he doesn't realize it is because of the economic conditions operating as the means of construction or production, not just of the economy, but of him, but of man, of society, and particularly of history. Marx said that he had the first scientific study of history. How is history produced? By man doing man's activity, and man's key activity was economic activity, as he saw it. And so economic production doesn't just produce the goods and services of the economy, it produces society itself. And society, in turn, produces man. He called this the inversion of praxis. And so when he says we must seize the means of production, and he's talking about factories and fields, he's actually talking about how we construct who we are as human beings so that we might complete ourselves, so that we might complete history. And at the end of history, mankind will remember that he is a social being, and we will have a socialist society. A perfect communism that transcends private property, is how he put it. He said, in fact, that communism is the transcendence of private property as human self-estrangement. That's a quote from the Economic Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. So Marx was interested in controlling, or understanding and controlling, 
How Man Produces Himself. And he writes about this ex exclusively in the 1840s, very deeply. How do we do this? And he looks at the economic conditions and he says, this is where it is. And that's why we get economic Marxism. And that's why we think Marx was an economist. But Marx was never an economist. He was a theologian. He wanted to produce a religion for mankind that would supersede all of the religions of mankind and bring him back to his true social nature. And this is the true fact of Marx. And what the goal was, like I said, is to complete man. So what he said is, well, how are we building man currently? All of his economic analysis is about how are we building man at present through what he called material determinism. And he said, well, what we have is a special form of private property in our society. Our society is organized around private property. And so all of our thoughts organize around private property. In other words, there's a special kind of property that the bourgeois elite class has access to, and then they organize society to exclude everybody else from access to that property through exploitation, through alienation, through estrangement, through oppression. And so what Karl Marx was proposing is that economics becomes a vehicle to separate society into a bourgeois class that has access to a special form of property, the people who have access wish to retain that, so they oppress people and keep other people out of that special form of property. They erect a system of classism to do that. It's enforced by an ideology called capitalism that believes that this is the right way to uh, engage in the world. And what we have to do is awaken the underclass, the proletariat, to the real conditions and the fact that they are historical agents of change and bring them to do a revolution and transform society so that we would have equity or socialism, whichever word you want. They have the same definition. Now, let's say that we step out. We, this is, we, we step back from this species, this economic species, Homo economicus, and we step back to the genus and we look at this idea, a special form of property that segregates society into people who have the bourgeois and the people who do not have, who are in class conflict with an ideology that keeps this in place. And the underclass must awaken with consciousness to fight back and to seize the means of production of that form of deterministic property. And now we say, change out class, put in race and watch, we get critical race theory falls out of the hat, just like that. Very simple. In 1993, Cheryl Harris wrote a long article for the Harvard Law Review called Whiteness as Property. She explained that whiteness or white privilege constitutes a kind of cultural private property. She says it must be abolished in order to have racial justice. Just like Karl Marx said that in the Communist Manifesto, he wrote, communism can be summarized in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. Well, this is why critical race theory calls to abolish whiteness, because whiteness is a form of private property. People who have access to this property are whites or white adjacent, or they act white. These are words out of the American lexicon that they've used to describe how, how people gain access to the private property. People without that are people of color, and they are oppressed by systemic racism. Systemic racism is enforced by an ideology of white supremacy instead of capitalism. If you think of whiteness as a form of cultural capital, white supremacy as they define it is identical to capitalism. It's the belief, it's not believing that white people are superior, it's believing that white people have access to the control of society and should maintain that. Even if you don't actually believe that, if you merely support that, you have adopted the, the ideology of white supremacy into your mind. And so you have the exact same system. And the goal is to awaken a racial consciousness in people so that they will band together as a class and seize the means of cultural production so that white cultural production is no longer the dominant mode. It's a big mystery in Europe, I know, in the UK, throughout Europe, I hear this question again and again. Why on earth is this very American phenomenon about slavery and so on that doesn't apply to our country? Why is it popular here? It's because it's not about history at all. It's not about slavery at all. Those are excuses that they use. It's about creating a class consciousness that's against this form of property called whiteness, that's against the dominant culture that may just be a matter of fact, say, if you're in Europe. That's why. 
because it becomes a site by which people can come together and they can channel resentment and try to claim power. I wrote a book called Race Marxism and I defined critical race theory as it really is in that book on the first page. I said that critical race theory is calling everything you want to control racist until you control it. But couldn't we say the same about Marxism? It's calling everything you want to control bourgeois until you control it. But those mean the same thing. They mean exactly the same thing. But what about, say, queer theory? How is that Marxist? It's very strange, all this gender and sex and sexuality. Well, Tom said, what is woke attack? The idea of being normal. Well, the queer theory thinks that there are certain people who get to set the norms of society. They are privileged. They call themselves normal. They say this is normal. It's normal to consider yourself a man and look like a man and act like a man and dress like a man and eat meat like a man. And then there are women. This should be feminine and pretty and the, all these things. And so they get to define what's normal. They're heterosexuals. So they get to define the heterosexuality as normal and other sexualities are abnormal. And so you have a conflict across this cultural property of who gets to be considered normal and who is a pervert or a freak or some other term that gets used in their literature. But technically, who is a queer? which sounds like a slur, but they adopted it, and it's a technical academic term now. It means an identity without an essence, by the way, an identity that is strictly oppositional to the concept of the normal, as defined by queer theorist David Halperin in his 1995 book, Saint Foucault, Toward a Gay Hagiography. I didn't make that up. I'm not extrapolating. So you see, queer theory is just another species of the genus of Marxism. What about post-colonial theory? which is plaguing Europe, thanks to Franz Fanon and his biggest European fan, Jean-Paul Sartre. What about this? What's well, the same? You have the West as the oppressor. They have access to the material and cultural wealth of the world because they've decided their culture is the default and have gone and colonized the world to bring culture to the world, as they say. And so the oppressed, the, 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 the natives around the world, the people have to band together and their activity is going to be called decolonization. They have to remove every aspect of Western culture. So when they come to Belgium or they come to France or they come to the United States and they say we're going to decolonize the curriculum or they go to the UK and say we're going to decolonize Shakespeare. This is what they mean. We're going to remove the cultural significance of your cultural artifacts because those cultural artifacts themselves are oppressive to us. This is the same system, it's another species in the exact same genus, and that genus is Marxism, which is a way of thinking about the world. And the goal is always to seize the means of control of the production of man and history and society. Marx merely believed it was through economic means. Now it's through socio-cultural means. The evolution into this sometimes called Western Marxism began in the 1920s. We had a Russian revolution in 1917, and this did not happen in Europe. And the Marxists in Europe were confused. And so Antonio Gramsci sat down and wrote out some things. And George Lukács sat down and wrote History and Class Consciousness after the failure of the revolution in Hungary. And they wrote what became cultural Marxism. The idea that we have to enter the cultural institutions in order to change them from within because Western culture has something about it that's repelling socialism. So we have to go inside and change the culture to make it socialist. Now, you aren't allowed to talk about cultural Marxism now. They've categorized this as a conspiracy theory. They say that it is anti-Semitic. This is not true. Antonio Gramsci wrote books. George Lukács wrote books. You can read those books. They have a philosophy. If they don't like the name cultural Marxism, we can use the name that other people at the time used, Western Marxism. So much like, uh, I don't know, a virus adapting to the conditions, it, it changed to try to infect a new host. It worked in feudal societies. Marxism took over in Russia. It took over later in China. It took over in all of these kind of agriculturally driven feudal societies, but it wouldn't work in actual capitalist nations because Marx was wrong. Then several Germans from the Frankfurt School started to study this phenomenon in more depth, and they evolved the idea further. They evolved the idea into what's called critical Marxism. They developed what's called the critical theory. And Max Horkheimer, who designed the critical theory, explained the critical theory. And what did he say? He said, well, 
what we came to realize was that Marx was wrong about one thing. Capitalism does not immiserate the worker. It allows him to build a better life. So I developed the critical theory because it is not possible to articulate the vision of a good society on the terms of the existing society. So critical Marxism criticizes the entirety of the existing society. Everything is somehow needing to be subjected to Marxist conflict analysis. But how is that to be done? They sought an answer through the middle part of the 20th century and World War II breaks out. The Frankfurt School comes to America, which in this metaphor is the Wuhan Institute of Virology because gain of function be began to happen on the Marxist virus very quickly in America. And American universities adopted these professors from Germany. And Herbert Marcuse, writing in the 1960s, said extremely clearly, this writing in 1969, not only did he say capitalism delivers the goods, gives people a good life, makes them wealthy and comfortable and happy. He also said that the working class is no longer going to the, be the base of the revolution because of these things. In other words, we don't have to be responsible to the working class anymore, which opens up the ability for Marxists who are seeking power to make friends with the corporations. The bosses are no longer the enemy, they're an opportunity because the working class is irrelevant. He said the energy is somewhere else. He said it's in the racial minorities the sexual minorities, the feminists, the outsiders. That's who he said have the energy for a Marxist revolution in the West, not the working class. And so Marxism was able to evolve to abandon the working class. And so what did they do? Well, all they had studied for 30 years was what they called the culture industry, an industry that commodifies and packages culture and sells it back to people, so supposedly stripped of what it actually is, empty abstract now. And so what, of course, did they do? They seized the means of production of the culture industry because that's what they do. And so they started to transform the culture industry to sell racial, sexual, gender, sexuality-based agitprop as though that were genuine culture. And so we get concepts like cultural appropriation. We get concepts like cultural relevance cultural this, cultural that, cultural everything. And it's all provided in pastiche. It's all provided uh, as, a, as, a, as a mockery of what's really going on. And this evolved in America's highly racialized context. And we ended up with woke, a form of identity-based Marxism, a, a constellation of Marxist species that all work with the same operating premise, but locate themselves in different, and I'll use the German term here for this, folk. LGBTQ is a folk. And they get folkish identity there and become activists. The black community is a folk. How do I know? That's what W.E.B. Du Bois said it would be when he laid down the foundations that became critical race theory later. They think of themselves as nations. Don't they all have flags? Don't they put them on your buildings like colonizers? Don't they hang them in your streets? They think of themselves as occupying nations, but they see themselves as bound together, just like the various colonized nations around the world and seeking liberation from Western civilization. And so we end up with Western Marxism taking many forms, but with one overarching approach. And the approach that they use, I started off by saying is Maoist, not merely Marxist. Now you know the theory is Marx. It's just evolved into different species to attack the West at its weakest points through our tolerance, through our acceptance, through our openness, through our generosity, through our best traits, actually. The things that we should be proud of being, the things that we are proud of being. But Mao Zedong knew how to use identity politics. I don't know how you study in Europe, but in America, we have very redwashed education, as we might say. The communists have stripped out all education about communism entirely. You don't learn about it in America at all. So we don't learn anything about Mao. And maybe you don't know this, but I tell this to American audiences and they're shocked. Mao used identity politics. He created 10 identities in China. Five, he labeled red for communist. Five, he labeled black for fascist. And he categorized people into these identity categories. What they are doesn't really matter. Of course, they were communists. They were things like landlord and rich farmer and things like this. 
Right winger is a bad category in and of itself, by the way. Conservative, all of them, bad. Bad influences, that's another one. You could be a bad influence for just thinking the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing at any time or because the government decides it doesn't like you. These are the bad categories. And if you have a bad category, very importantly, your children have a bad category by default. So they create a social pressure for your children to identify as revolutionaries, at which point they get a red identity, a communist identity, a good identity. And they get rewarded for it. And the youth read, led the revolution in China because Mao did this, identity politics through the children in the schools. This should feel very uncomfortable to you. Because here we have, at least in the United States, we tell our children being white is bad. Being white is oppressive. You automatically hurt people of other races by your very existence. But by the way, if you become queer, we'll celebrate you. And you can create a radical army of people who identify as gender minorities and sexual minorities at seven years old. You can lead them into paths of puberty blockers and transition, medical transition, which of course Big Pharma profits off of. At seven years old, behind their parents' back. There's a reason for this. It's the same program that Mao Zedong used to radicalize the youth in China. The only thing different is the identity categories have, have shifted. It's Maoist cultural revolution with American characteristics, and it's being exported to Europe. And just like how critical race theory has come to Europe, even though it doesn't make sense, it will come to Europe, whether it makes sense or not, and you will have a cultural revolution here too. You guys even had a kind of offshoot one in 2020. George Floyd dies in Minnesota, which has nothing to do with you. And you guys have statues coming down in Europe. Total nonsense. It doesn't matter though. The point is to destroy Western civilization from within using Maoist techniques. One last point about Mao to kind of drive that point home. Mao said in 1942 that his formula to transform China was called unity, criticism, unity. First, you try to create the desire for unity. Then you criticize people for not living up to that. Then you bring them into unity under a new standard. Does that feel like what you're being put through? But the words are different. We use words like inclusion and belonging. We'll have a place where everybody feels like they belong. We just want to have an inclusive space. But unfortunately, you have racist ideas and you have to criticize for you. We have to criticize you for those. You need to criticize yourself for those. You need to go study Shui Shi in Mandarin, exactly like Mao said. And then we can bring you into unity under a new standard, which Mao called socialist discipline, which we in the West would not buy. We call it in the West inclusion. And so we have this new program, and within inclusion we have, or above inclusion actually, we have sustainability. We have a sustainable and inclusive future. I see the Agenda 2030 here with an X over it. The sustainable and inclusive future is the new socialist standard, that we will have freedom under socialist discipline. And Mao said the way that that will work is through what he called democratic centralism. We call that stakeholder capitalism. And my shot at the World Economic Forum is taken because it's one of the things coordinating this. My shot at the United Nations is taken because it's one of the things that's coordinating this. So woke is Marxism. It's advancing through Maoist cultural revolution. It's using Americanized identity categories. And while some of those will not work in Europe, I guarantee you the colonial aspect will. They will find your weakness. They will adapt the theory to fit because it's like a virus that will evolve to its host. And Europe is at great risk. Now, the last thing I'll mention is this risk is twofold. When you endure Marxist provocation, Marxist strategy is always of the same type. It's called middle-level violence. They don't come at you with full-blown Bolshevik assault very often. It's middle-level violence. They provoke, which means if you give in, and you do like Jean-Paul Sartre said in his foreword to The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, the, the post-colonial book, he said, the violence is coming. So Europe's best bet is to give it away so that they don't kill you. They'll murder you and take it, or maybe you can give it away, give your culture away, give your countries away, and they'll let you live. They're coming for you. And this is what Europe needs to learn. That's what he says in the foreword of Wretched of the Earth. You can read it for yourself, probably in the original French that I can't read. And I think that's the path Europe has followed. So you can give away. That's one side because they provoke at the middle. 
Or you can react and overreact, which sadly Europe has had a, a rough history in the last century with overreactions. And if, they, if you overreact, what will they do? They will weaponize your overreaction for a century, forever, and gain moral authority so that you end up having to give it away later anyway. So you have to stand firm in your principles, but you have to do so cleverly. You have to do so understanding that you're being provoked, which means you don't react as the, prov the provocateur wants you to react. You have to outsmart them, which is not possible unless you know the diagnosis of your problem. It's a Polish proverb, never attempt to cure what you don't understand. Woke is Marxism, evolved to attack the West. If you don't understand that, you will not act correctly. You will not cure it, and it will conquer your countries. It will conquer all of Europe, and we will have a very, very long, sustainable, and inclusive future with absolutely no freedom. Because the goal is to make us into what they call global citizens. Have you heard this term? This term is nonsense. There's no global sovereign, so there is no global citizenship. There's no relationship because there's no ruler, and we don't want a ruler of the globe. It's a nonsense term. But they tell you, if you actually read their literature, what is a global citizen? It's somebody, I kid you not, I make no joke, they say this themselves, it's somebody who supports the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030. That's a global citizen. And they say, what are the rights of a global citizen? This is in a book about global citizenship education published two years ago. What are the rights of a global citizen? And the answer, one paragraph later, is we're not that interested in rights with global citizenship. It's more about global responsibilities. In other words, slavery. This is a pivotal moment in the history of the Western world. The model that they are pushing us toward Using the means and mechanisms of that place is the model we see in China. If you want to know what your future looks like if we don't stop the woke, look at China. Look at the social credit system. Look at the oppression. Look at people disappearing for having the wrong opinions. One of their greatest billionaires, Jack Ma, said the wrong thing about the government and disappeared. A billionaire. If you want to know what the future of Europe and America and the Five Eyes or whatever the countries, it's China. That's the model. So we have to fight back against woke, but to fight back against woke, we have to understand it. And I will close by restating my thesis. Woke is Marxism evolved to take on the West. And it's been very successful so far because we haven't known our enemy. We cannot name our enemy. And I've come here to name our enemy. So thank you for your time and attention and letting me do that. Hello, everybody. Bonjour, salve, siostok. Um, does anybody want to know my pronoun before I begin? Or not an issue? Look, uh, I'm going to bring you some bad news. And the bad news is, is that people like you and the traditions that you come from do not understand the problem that we are confronted with. The historical problem of conservatives of the right, when they deal with the cultural revolution that's sweeping the Western world, is that they've never addressed the question, why is it getting stronger and stronger all the time? I mean, why are ideas that you and I are fairly clear, are fairly stupid, don't make very much sense, gaining so much traction, gaining so much momentum? Why is it that you have a situation where some of the leading cultural figures of our times, leading politicians of our times, leading, leading intellectuals, are essentially uh, saying and talking about ideals that are the very antithesis of Western civilization, what Western culture was all about? And I think the reason for that is because we're always blaming somebody else. Right? We always think that the problem is that these people are somehow working behind our back and are tricking us to do something. 
We never actually think about our own responsibility for the spread of uh, what uh, is called woke. We don't think of the fact that perhaps people like ourselves in the past or previous generations might have been too cowardly or lacked the intellectual resources to fight back. There's always been a lot of complacency. And I always remember very, very clearly before COVID going to the United States and arguing with Americans about this issue. And I was trying to explain to them that uh, this whole phenomenon that, that we're talking about comes from above, right? The ideals that, that we are discussing with don't come from below. It's not ordinary people that have come up with these ideas. They come from above, right? And I remember debating and I'm telling them, well, look, you know, you Americans in particular, will find that every single one of your institutions, without exception, will follow what the universities have done. You know, you too will adopt the same cultural practices. And I remember this one guy, I always get into arguments with Americans. This one guy gets up and says, you know, Frank, you're so wrong. You're such an idiot. How could you say that every institution will become woke? Our corporations, you know, are all interested in making profit they're going to stand up against this. There's no way that big businessmen are going to follow the path of university professors. And then another the person puts up his hand and says, Frank, you don't realize we have sturdy American institutions that are going to resist woke. I says, which one is that? This is sports. You know, sports, American sport, is so robust, is so athletic, is so masculine, it will never become in invested in this. And just look what happens. Big business in the United States is gone LBGTQ plus, 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 to the point at which there aren't enough letters in the alphabet anymore. They're trying to reinvent the English language and the English alphabet to add a few more letters to it just for the future. It's a big business. Look at sport. Every American sport from NASCAR which used to be a sport that Southern conservatives used to love, all the way to basketball, all the way to football, has become committed to taking the knee. I mean, there's nothing more nauseating for me than when you see athletes taking the knee and in kind of sub, you know, this kind of subservient way acting slavishly. So what I'm arguing is that the phenomenon we're talking about I don't think it is Marxism, we can have a debate about that, or has anything to do with Marxism, is very much a top-down uh, sort of development. And the origins of this was already recognized by many thinkers. The problem was already recognized by people who had perspicacity in the 1970s. In 1972, one of the advisors to President Nixon basically said, Richard, we've lost the culture war. Almost every single opinion-making institution has gone over the other side. We may run the White House, but we don't anymore have the intellectual, moral, or cultural support to carry on with this. And the problem that he identified did, but didn't understand was this. I remember this because I'm probably the oldest person in this room. And I remember being a student radical in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, when we were student radicals, we used to have you know, blowback. People would kind of fight back against us. We'd have big debates. People would stand up against us. By the time I became a university professor in 1972, when I got my first job, there was literally a handful of us who were professors in the university who was prepared to fight back against the Cultural Revolution. And what you saw in the university was essentially a process whereby these so-called radicals who were prom promoting woke ideals were kicking up against an open door. So the point I want to make, first of all, is that the main responsibility for the rise of woke is the bourgeoisie of Europe. It is the capitalist class in Europe who basically gave way at every single instance. In Holland, for example, they basically said, oh, these guys are woke, they are already radical, we'll make them like us. When they grow up, when they become 30, 35, they will become good Dutch entrepreneurs. They said the same thing in Belgium. 
Oh, yeah, when these guys become 25, 26, 27, they'll forget about their youthful radicalism. But what they didn't understand, and it's something that sociological theory teaches us, is that every generation influences the next. And it usually takes about five generations before new ideals become institutionalized. And I think what, has, what happened is that people just don't understand this, that they basically are saying, oh, it's not a big problem. It's just a bunch of student radicals. It will stop at the universities. Now, today, they don't say that because, obviously, it hasn't stopped at the universities in Europe. But I know that when I travel and I talk to people, for example, when I went to France recently, I talked to people in Paris about the problem of woke. They say, oh, that's an American phenomenon. You know, we French are very lucky. You know, apparently, there's a cordon sanitaire in France against wokeish kind of ideas. They don't realize that France has already become influenced by those kinds of sentiments. You go to Italy. You know, I go to Lombardy. You know, quite, I go to Milan quite often. And I talk to people there. And they say, oh, no, no, Italy, Italy is all right. Italy is not like America or, or England. We don't have woke. And I tell them, why don't you watch Ellie, Schle Ellie Schlein and her party and see what they really are, are, are about. And you realize that unless you do something very, very significant, Ellie Schlein will be the future of Italy when you open your eyes and you basically begin to wake up. There's no sense in which people really understand that wokishness has already acquired a really important foothold in many, many institutions. And there are good reasons for that. My job today is to tell you why woke is spreading in the European context. And I think there are two forces that are driving the spread of woke in our continent. The first one is American soft power. I mean, American soft power is really important, even in Hungary, which is one of the most anti-woke country in the, is the most, I think, anti-woke country in the world. Even in Hungary, you can see that woke soft power, American soft power, does have an incredible influence. You know, when you watch something like Netflix, have you guys ever heard of Netflix? I mean, watch every TV program on Netflix, and every TV program is the same. The white heterosexual guy is an idiot. Right? <laughs> I mean, he can barely tie his shoelaces. He's so stupid, right? Very insensitive. The uh, homosexual interior decorator, it's always an interior decorator, knows all about food, you know, he's a real foodie, tells you how to live a healthy life. He's got an incredibly good body, right? He's emotionally very, very literate. And he, he's very good at, at, in a sense, apologizing for the behavior of his heterosexual friend. But that was, this is the program of 15 years ago. The new Netflix program has made a modification. So have any of you watched Sex Education? I think you should, as politicians, or would-be politicians, you should watch it. Because sex education is so interesting. In sex education, which is really about promoting transgender ideology, you have a situation where the only sensitive people in the program are trans kids. I mean, the two trans main characters are the only ones. They're the ones that are fighting against what's called heteronormativity. Uh, I'm, I signed up to that, heteronormativity. It's who I am. It's part of my identity. But in, in these TV programs, everybody other than the trans kids have got a major kind of problem. Now, just imagine if you're a 15-year-old kid in Milan or in Paris or Budapest or Warsaw watching sex education and all these programs, you will begin to draw the conclusion that what's really, really cool is to basically go out and give yourself a pronoun. That it is really, really cool to be transgender. And when you look at youth culture, the way it's began to kick in, you'll find that, especially in the urban centers, it's become <clears throat> extremely powerful. And even more, because in addition to Netflix and other forms of soft power, you have music, American music. I mean, kids in Central Europe don't listen to, you know, Polish or Czech or Hungarian folk music. 
right? They don't listen to the music of their parents or their ancestors. They listen to American music, rap music, and other kind of stuff. And the message that comes through all the time is that it's really, really cool to be woke. And it's really, really uncool to be like us. I mean, people like us have lost it. We're on the wrong side of history. Or to use their American expression, we don't get it. So that's the first driver, American soft power. And American soft power is a huge enemy that we face because it insidiously uh, sort of manages to manipulate particularly young people. The second one, uh, the second major transmitter of wokeness in Europe is the European Union. I mean, is anybody surprised by the institutions of the European Union? I mean, I didn't realize until I came to Brussels and I had to begin to read the different documents. I really didn't, I must have been very, very naive just how much these ideals have become integral to the outlook of the European Union bureaucrats, the Eurocrats, basically. It's almost as if you can imagine these Eurocrats get up in the morning and they brush their teeth and they basically say, hmm, this is going to be an inclusion morning for me. Right? You know, it's going to be an inclusion morning for me because you know, I believe in diversity. When you ask them what they mean by inclusion or diversity, and you should ask them sometimes what they really mean by it, they struggle. You know, they got all these uh, airshats values, what, what in old English we call bullshit values, which they casually you know, sort of draft in their documents. And, and when they draft them in their documents, I don't know if you noticed this, I'm sure there are MEPs here or legal scholars here. When they draft their documents and internalize all these new concepts, they always say that this is something that's been advised to them by the experts, by the stakeholders. That apparently there are all these people around who are giving them expert advice about the importance of this. But the most important thing that I've noticed the European Union is doing and is leading is mainstreaming gender. Mainstreaming gender, not only mainstreaming gender, but introducing the concept of gender conditionality which basically means that in the Czech Republic or in Romania, you want to get some money from the European Union, you got to basically mainstream gender. You got to demonstrate that uh, you're extremely sensitive to this issue, that you are aware is a word they kind of use and, and, and very much indicate to them that you're prepared to play the game. Now, the problem is that you probably think that this is a joke. You probably think that this is something you have to do. You kind of pretend to accept it. But the minute you begin to sign up to this, what gender mainstreaming is becomes very, very real. And it becomes extremely potent and very, very powerful. So how does this work? So yesterday, one of my friends sent me the document. I, I don't like reading things out. A document from the parliamentary legislative resolution on equal pay. And uh, the, the draft terminology used says that when we talked about these kinds of issues in 1957, medical and biological fields did not really understand that the definition of sex was more diverse than simply man and woman. In other words, what they're saying that is that in 1957, we had this very primitive idea, this very outdated idea, that recognized that sex was really, biological sex was really about a man and a woman. And isn't that funny that in 1957, we were so stupid to believe this? Because now, in 2023, we can leave those old outdated ideas behind. The European Union is committed to leaving those old ideas behind. And we're now going to introduce a kind of commitment to discussing sexual distinctions, not just as between men and women, but about as dozens of other kind of genders. And not only that, what they're saying is that if you don't recognize this, if you don't recognize the new definition of biological sex, you're going to pay a price, you're going to pay a penalty for this. So this is something that is imposed through the European Union, not just on you, <clears throat> but all European citizens. 
Now, here we come to what I think is the central battlefield in Europe. And the central battlefield is demonstrated by the fact that what they are saying is that anything that was good or seen as being positive in 1957 is by definition bad in 2023. They call it outdated ideas. They basically say that these are outdated ideas and we have to come up with a new language, a totally new language that we take forward in our world. I think that this is a very big problem because what you're really saying is that we need to detach Europe and European cultures from their historical origins. What you're really saying is that the legacy of the past, the cultural legacy of the past, which organically links us to our ancestors, to what has gone on before, needs to be ruptured. That what we need is both a language and an attitude that's got nothing to do. It's what in Chinese politics they used to call year zero. You know, we're in, living in a year zero and we're following year zero politics. I just want to basically end by saying that the, as the language changes, we become different people if we accept it. Let me give you one example that, I, that shocked me. I've done a lot of work on education in my time, but I was surprised to discover that the European Union thanks to the advice of the United Nations and UNESCO, now argues that we should no longer use the term sex education. Now, sex education, when I was young, basically meant learning about the birds and the bees, learning about how humans reproduce themselves, learning about biology. That's what sex education was. It's an okay subject, you know, not the most important subject, not, not as important as literature or philosophy or theology, but okay, you have to learn that. Now, they tell us that sex education should no longer be used because it's outdated, everything is outdated, and instead of sex education, we should have sexuality education. Now, you might think, well, so what? Sex education, sexuality, so what? But actually, what does sexuality education mean? It no longer means anything to do with biological men and women. It no longer has got anything to do with sexual reproduction. Sexuality education is about gender and gender identity. It's your sexuality, how you define your sexuality. And in every school in the European Union, there is now an attempt being made to bring in sexuality education and essentially teach four, five, six-year-old children about their gender. And in particular, not just tell them who they are about their gender, but just to tell them, hey, Mary, hey, Johnny, you, you think that you're a boy, you think you're a girl, but if, if you discover when you're 10 years old or 14 years old that you're actually maybe somebody different, that's cool, that, that's okay. We'll help you out with that because sexuality education teaches you that you are fluid as an individual, you're, as a... As a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a non-binary individual, you might think this is a, so what? It's a small matter. But what it does is that it enslaves our children. European children who become subjected to this educational process basically have their identities as boys and girls sabotaged, disrupted. You know, when you're six and seven, you actually being a boy or a girl is really crucially important about who you are. That's me as a boy. If you begin to have doubts, because this is what you learn in sexuality education, if you're putting a question mark about your sex, then your very identity, the most foundational dimension of your identity, begins to be called into question. And we're now seeing in Europe the beginnings of an American type identity crisis sweeping young people to the point at which they are, their identity is being disrupted with very important mental health consequences. The most important target of the war against the past of all dated language is children. And the second important target of this uh, war against the past is the family. One of my colleagues in MCC Brussels has, is working on a document called the European Union and the disappearing family. 
And what she means by disappearing family, how the family disappears, is by the fact that if you look at EU documents on the family, they talk a lot about children, they talk about, a lot about women, they talk a lot about uh, LGBTQ families, but what they never talk about is a family. The family has disappeared in these documents. And not only that, but when the family is mentioned, in a few places where the family is mentioned, the family is <clears throat> mentioned as an impediment to the well-being of women and children. Somehow the family becomes responsible for horrible things that happen to women and for very bad things that happen to children. So basically, if you follow the logic of those documents, you would never want to be in a family. I mean, who wants to live in this horrible institution which basically flourishes by doing terrible things to people? So this seems to me to be a really, really quite important for us to understand that the whole tendency towards the spread of woke within the European continent, which is ultimately the responsibility of the people that run our society, is, is actually targeting our children, targeting our families, but most important of all, most important than anything else, is targeting our past. It is a war against the past. They want us to forget where we come from. They want us to forget who we are. They want us to forget about the legacy of Greece, the legacy of Rome, the legacy of the Judeo-Christian culture. They want to forget us about the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And basically, they want to free us of all these horrible things that have happened. And if they do manage to free us and liberate us from our culture, then basically we lose the capacity of knowing where our future lies, and we lose the capacity of our finding our way within the future. So there's a lot to struggle about, and my only advice to everybody is don't point a finger at the woke, point a finger at yourself, and ask the question, what are we doing to fight it? I ask that for conservatives, because one of the most irritating things about conservatives is they always tell you, oh, the teachers are messing up our children. I say, well, how many conservatives do you know who have, sent, who have encouraged their children to be teachers? Right? How many conservatives do you know that try to become university professors? In America especially, I know of American professors who said it's much more comfortable working in a think tank than struggling in a university. They've basically given up the university. And I know loads and loads of conservative people who talk about education all the time, but they would be very, very unhappy if their son or daughter became a teacher. You know, they should become business ladies or businessmen. That's, you know, bankers or doctors or dentists. But teacher, well, you know, if that's your attitude and you leave your children to be taught by the other side, what's going to happen? Why complain that they're messing around with your kids' heads when you haven't made that kind of contribution? So, really, we've got to look to ourselves because we are both the problem, but we're also the solution. If we take this phenomenon seriously and actually call the culture war by its right name and not shy away from that, not say that the culture war is a secondary phenomenon, if we can adopt a more robust fighting attitude, then we can get the ordinary people on our side. Ordinary people all over Europe will support us against the elites, against the corporations, against the people on top who are promoting this ideology. And we will win. And we will win, I'm sure, but I would rather it was sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Faridi. Uh, am I clear to everyone? Yes? OK. Uh, my name is Paul Boniface, and on behalf of the Identity and Democracy Foundation, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here in this room and also the people following us online on YouTube. Um, uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be in the company of such uh, great, towering intellectual figures in this field. Um, I think we uh, understand that uh, Dr. Lindsay and Professor Furedi put different uh, focus and different accents. So um, 
If it were up to me, I would uh, ask uh, to uh, close the door and listen to this gentleman the rest of the afternoon. But I think I will get in a lot of trouble with the interpreters. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, um, these gentlemen never met before today. So I think it's going to be interesting to have a, a little discussion and see how they think on, on various issues, uh, which will be followed by... Um, I will put my clock so that we don't overrun the time. Uh, we'll have a little discussion, and then after we will put some questions to you because we are, of, of course, very keen to hear uh, your questions on these uh, topics that we discussed. Okay? So my first question to uh, both gentlemen, maybe I start with you, Dr. Lindsay, is um, this uh, ideology has really taken hold of uh, lots of young people uh, who Vivek Ramazwamy writes in his book, uh, young people are hungry for a cause, and they see in this ideology uh, a way of actually doing something very positive, very good. Uh, and I genuinely believe that um, they think that uh, woke means being uh, sensitive to all kinds of uh, different types of oppression, which has remained hidden before, and woke makes this visible. So... My question to both gentlemen is, uh, what is wrong with this? And when, uh, when does woke go too far? So did I do this, did I do this right? Yes? yes. OK. So the, the second question is far easier, is when does woke go too far? And I, did, I delivered this lecture at Oxford in, in November. Uh, on its own terms, woke never goes too far. Uh, the, the revolution, in the words of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian Marxist educator whose educational model has conquered the United States, uh, that the, the cultural revolution must be perpetual, in other words, uh, in order to be authentic. In other words, he says, in, in his own words, that if, if the revolution ceases to be perpetual, then it becomes a new status quo, and the new status quo has to be conquered. And so he says that the answer when you've developed a critical consciousness and you've led the country to revolution is that you must develop a new critical consciousness and lead it to more revolution. So in other words, woke on its own terms never goes too far. And that means from outside of its terms, woke always goes too far because it has no limiting principle. It has nothing that will stop it. It's a train without brakes. And since it's so destructive, it will eventually destroy any society that lets it in. Uh, I think Vivek is correct that young people hunger for a cause, to address the first question. I think that woke does allow them to feel, and I think most young people who take it up do feel, in their kind of idealism and their naivety, that they are helping, that they are being more sensitive, that they're being empathetic, that they're caring about people who failed to be cared for in the past, that they're sensitive to issues that privilege will allow you to ignore, but they don't know that they're being lied to. And I think that that's very important. We've heard this both from myself and from Dr. Faridi. We've heard this. Inclusion does not mean inclusion. Inclusion means that we're going to censor and exclude everybody who has opinions and every opinion that doesn't conform to the woke ideology so that the people there can feel safe. But if people can't speak, People are not safe. How did Chernobyl melt down? Because the people were afraid to speak, that they saw something was wrong because they knew the Soviets would kill them if they said something's going wrong. If you can't speak when there's a problem, you're not safe. So they're being lied to. It creates the opposite of safety. It creates the opposite of inclusion. In our country, we have in California, we had the governor uh, was almost recalled and they, uh, a black man from East L.A., one of the most ethnically American black places on the planet, named Larry Elder, ran for governor in the Los Angeles Times, because he's a conservative, ran a headline that said, Larry Elder is the black face of white supremacy. What does that mean? We just had a murder recently in Memphis, Tennessee, where five black police officers went and beat up and killed somebody that they were trying to arrest. And the headline that ran was that policing itself is white supremacist in its nature, so these black police officers adopted white supremacy in order to commit this murder. What does this mean? It means that in order to be 
legitimately black or legitimately gay or legitimately a woman, you have to hold the correct opinions. You have to have the correct politics. I hearken back to something Mar that, that Mao Zedong said in 1957. He said, to not have correct political opinions is like not having a soul. If your opinions are wrong, you don't count. If your opinions are right, you're a person. And so they're being lied to. They're being fed something that feels good. And if they realize that they're being lied to and that what they're being fed is not true, then they might see that what they're creating is actually exactly the opposite. They're not creating safety. They're not creating inclusion. They're not creating a welcoming environment. Everybody's scared to speak. Everybody knows if they say the wrong thing, they will be canceled. And harm builds up and harm builds up and people won't speak out. And then eventually there are deaths and there are problems because everybody's too afraid to speak. So uh, in essence, what you're saying is it's, it's kind of an, an, an ideology of oppression almost. Uh, uh, Professor Fried, is there anything you'd like to add or comment on this, on this question? Yeah, I mean, first of all, too far because sorry does that work can you hear me now i mean i can shout yes yes um <laughs> Yeah, so I think that the walk always goes too far for the very simple reason that it hasn't got any kind of redeeming feature. And I don't accept uh, neither the argument that's used by particularly American liberals that there is something good in walk because it, it, it's a very sensitive ideology. It, 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 it kind of appeals to a kind of idealistic, morally uh, positive instinct within us because I think that basically uh, sort of gives the ground give the moral high ground to our opponents. The question that, uh, well, the question that is really the most important one is why is it that these young people find a focus for their ideology or their focus for their idealism in this particular direction rather than in our direction? I mean, that's what you have to be concerned about. Why do they go there rather than to us? And I think that if we begin to pose the question in that way, we'll find an answer sooner or later. But if we concentrate on somehow Vogue having this automatic appeal, that this becomes a focus of idealism, then we'll lose the plot. Very briefly, the reason why they go there rather than to us is because basically since the 1970s, every ideology that was associated with Western culture has disintegrated. There's no communism, there's no socialism, there's no liberalism. Even conservatism gave away a lot in the late 1970s and basically stopped believing in itself. And therefore, what we're finding is that today, it's the people that in Europe they call populists, which I would describe myself as one as well, who are beginning to struggle to find some kind of an answer about the existential problems that confront us. So our job is to find a medium through which our answers can become popular, which principally means we've got to have a more powerful presence in the media. We've got to even create our own media. We've got to create our own music. We've got to have to do everything that is necessary to make us as cool, as ideally, uh, idealistically appealing as the other side. There's no point worrying about them until we get our act together. And we haven't got that much time. So, yes, that's, to me, the, 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 the way that I would approach this problem. Uh, Professor, uh, another question. When you confront people who are woke with the consequences of their ideology, you always get the same cascade of, of replies. First, they deny that woke exists. Then they sort of try to minimize the effects of woke, saying, oh, it's not that bad, and you're exaggerating, and you're overacting. And then in the end, when the argument is finished, they, they insult you. They call you racist, transphobe, fascist, uh, conspiracy thinker. And the latest one is anti-government thinker. So uh, the question is, is, it, is there even any point or any basis to discuss with people who are really immersed in this ideology? Or is there simply no language with which we can communicate? Well, I'm a big believer in that. Uh... I'm a big believer in not giving up the fight, and I often talk to people, particularly students. Uh, particularly, my, my focus is on uh, gymnasium students who are 17 or 18, still idealistic, still being open to being convinced. And I find that if you argue with them, at the very least, you can shake their beliefs. They might not agree with you, 
But by using humor, maybe it's not humor because I'm not that funny, but I sometimes think, okay, it's a bit of humor. You can make them laugh and make them think and make them question. And my minimal platform is that if I go away and they say, okay, Frank is an idiot, but at least he said something interesting, I'm happy with that. That's like the minimum. More than that, I think that it's possible to at least appeal to a minority because woke ideology, especially at that age, isn't so deeply embedded, especially when it's shallow. It's, a, it's like an emperor, no clothes. Unfortunately, we haven't got enough children who say that the emperor has got no clothes, but we've got to do that. So I think there is a lot of, you know, we should be doing it. And at the very least, if everything fails, by our arguments, we need to make them feel very, very uncomfortable, right? Very, very uncomfortable so that they feel disturbed and, and somehow realize that they haven't got a monopoly over the audience and haven't got a monopoly over the political terrain that we work in. Uh, Dr. Lindsay, you have a lot of experience uh, in um, uh, trying to debate the other side. Um, can you share some of your thoughts on this topic? Yes, I, don't, I do not think that, that debate with the other side works. Uh, much like the professor, our, what they offer is not grounded in truth. So they don't have much to debate. They have a great deal of rhetoric. And this cascade always follows. First, it doesn't exist. And then it's good that it exists. And you're a racist because you don't like it. And, and something like this. And it's always the same pattern. And the reason, actually, I believe, is because their goal is not to put forth ideas and debate ideas and discuss ideas. I believe that they believe that they already know the truth, that they know the truth absolutely. And you, unfortunately, as, as the lingo goes, have outdated ideas. And so they discredit your ideas from the beginning. So this pattern that you describe, as a matter of fact, is a pattern in which first they're trying to intellectually humiliate you. You don't know the words even. You don't understand. Your ideas are outdated. And if that doesn't work, they try to morally invalidate you. You're a racist. You're a sexist. You're something. You have some terrible character flaw. And then in the end, if that doesn't work, they try to psychologically invalidate you. You're crazy. You're a conspiracy theorist. You can't trust your own eyes and ears because you've been conditioned to misinterpret them through conservative ideology or something. So they always try to under, undermine your own sense of authority, both in the eyes of others who might be watching, but also within yourself so that you enter into that state of doubt that we have to answer. In America, we have a slang term that the answer to that is that you have to be based. That's a fun slang word that you should make popular in Europe. It means that you have your feet on the ground morally and intellectually, that when you tell the truth, you know you're telling the truth. That if you are doing judo or something, you have your base, they can't throw you. Well, they come with moral arguments or intellectual nonsense, and they try to throw you off of your base. And if you get based, then you can protect yourself. You know that your values are sound. You know that you've done the research. You know that you've thought it through. And so when you actually try to engage with their arguments, what I found is that you have to do two arguments. So you have to develop the intellectual resources the professor was talking about. You must know their argument and how they're using it, which is actually two things. You must know their argument. You must know the purpose of their argument. You're trying to intellectually invalidate me with that and name that dynamic. And then you say the truth is this. And so then you have to give two to three arguments and let other people. It often does not work with the woke. They're utterly convinced in my experience that they know the absolute and only truth. But other people will see. Now, the professor points out the other most important thing, because most people who are woke don't realize how woke they are. Mo they're not terribly committed. Their friends care if they're woke, so they follow. They see it on TV or Netflix, so they think it's cool, so they do it. They don't know the, they don't know the theories behind this. They don't know the, the race theory or the, the feminism or whatever. They're just going along with the crowd. Well, the easiest way to interrupt that is by getting them, the, the woke is absurd, so getting them to laugh about it which means to laugh at themselves. If Mao's formula has in the middle, it was unity, criticism, unity, the criticism is the part where he induces a, a cycle of shame and guilt and causes people to try to resolve that guilt and shame by calling other people out, by calling themselves out. If you get them to laugh it off, it goes away. Look at what the comedians did in the 80s and the 90s with the race. 
especially if you look at American comedians from the 90s making fun of white people for racist attitudes, but in ways where everybody laughed. Many racist attitudes were dissolved because white people who held them were able to laugh them off. The same is true for people who hold woke ideas. If you can get them to laugh, that it's actually absurd. What do you mean I have to name my pronouns? Look. If you get them to laugh, they can let go. And I think that's a very important ingredient because uh, humor is soft and criticism is harsh. And I think that that's actually the, the path. But humiliating them for their bad ideas with their, their own arguments is also very important for other people to watch. Uh, on the topic of, um, you mentioned feminism in your reply, uh, but I'd like to delve into a little bit into this question of masculinity, femininity. Uh, and there's been a concrete recent example here in Belgium which uh, made my blood boil. Uh, on International Women's Day, a school in Belgium forced 14-year-old boys to remain standing while, um, uh, while the girls could see, were allowed to sit down. Uh, and this, uh, the intention was that they would experience what oppression feels like. So these boys, as a category, were made to feel guilty. Uh, and this kind of humiliation was approved in our newspaper by a Belgian pedagogue who is also an advisor to the Flemish government. So, and afterwards the school was not reprimanded. So my question to you is, what does this say about the attitude to masculinity? And what does this say about the, the, um, the infiltration of these ideas deeply into our culture, that this kind of humiliation of minors uh, goes without any kind of objection? Well, uh, actually, they made a big mistake because by having the boys stand while the girls were sitting, that's being gentlemen in the old school kind of a way. So that, that could be pointed out that you messed up this time, you know, sort of because you were reinforcing 19th century stereotypes between polite boys and, you know, and, and girls. But there's a concept that uh, underpins the pedagogy. And it's a concept I probably hate more than any other concept, which is, I don't know if, if you heard of it yet, called toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity basically means that masculinity by its definition is poisonous. And the interesting thing is that people who use the word toxic masculinity are not saying that there's a, a, a kind of masculinity that isn't toxic, every kind of masculinity. So if you're, if you're what I call, I'm old school, so we have an expression called a real man. But you know, a real man doesn't have to be like Tarzan or you know, have strong muscles, but you know, a, 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 what we call a regular guy. Now. By being a real man, a regular guy, you are toxic by definition. And in, 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 in England, they do this, uh, there's a, a really woke radio program which the elite listens to. And at least once a week, they will make fun of the expression, boys will be boys. I don't know how that translates into French or Italian, but boys will be boys basically means this is what a boy does. You know, we also say girls will be girls, this is what girls do. And they think that's like a cultural crime. It's a cultural crime to say these kinds of things. And what they've done is this, they've gone about systematically undermining men from having the confidence to being men. Uh, I, I know this because both as an educator in university, but also as a father watching my son's friend. My, my son is now 26, 27. You know, his male friends in England uh, tend to be ambivalent about their masculinity. Not because they inside feel there's anything wrong with it, but because they've been told so many times that being a man is morally inferior to being a woman, that you can begin to gradually internalize that. And I think the, the real problem here, uh, the thing that you're pointing out, is this systematic attempt to morally devalue being a man. Right? And that, to me, is a, is a cultural crime. Because in our world, we need to be in a situation where there is moral equality between men and women. That we appreciate female qualities and, and male qualities instead of somehow trying to create a hierarchy of people who are better than other kinds of people. And I think that kind of school, you know, your political party should organize demonstrations in front of it and making fun of the whole kind of scenario just to show the world how observed this kind of uh, circus we really is. Well, good for you. I'll vote for you next time. If, uh... 
If I can just uh, follow up on, on this uh, uh, issue briefly, I think uh, Dr. Lindsay wrote, uh, literally wrote the book uh, on the origins, the philosophical origins of this uh, woke phenomenon with uh, cynical theories. And uh, if I can do a little plug, I would recommend all of you to follow newdiscourses.com, where he explains in great detail the origins and, and the, the philosophical uh, questions surrounding this. But uh, my comment is as follows. Uh, there is another aspect to this whole ideology, which is now being highlighted by a group of women in the UK uh, and the US. Uh, there's Mary Harrington, there's Louise Perry, and in the US there's Mary Eberstadt, who all point to the uncounted cost of the sexual revolution as a major driver for this ideology, which also I think the professor referred to. It's the dis disintegration of families uh, and family life as, as a foundation of Western society. So this uh, exciting new school of uh, feminists who call themselves reactionary feminists, they reject the current egalitarian Orwellian type of feminism uh, and they advocate, uh, advocate for a new kind of feminism which they call the feminism of care. Now, as this whole ideology seems to have started with uh, 1977 with the Kumbahi River Collective, women have always played, uh, uh, seem to, to me to have played a very important role in the promotion of this ideology. So am I right in, in assuming that this female counter-movement is giving me a lot of hope? What do you think? Well, I am hopeful that there's any uh, belligerence against the woke. And if feminists speak up in feminist ways and not feminists speak up in not feminist ways, I think these are all are hopeful developments. That, that People within feminism are clearly seeing this problem is hopeful. Now, as far as the incident at the school, I think I actually must take credit for what happened. Because if you don't know my history, in 2017 and 18, before I started writing on this issue professionally, I wrote a series of academic articles that were fake, and they were supposed to be jokes, and we submitted them to leading academic journals in feminism and uh, gender studies and race studies and so on. And one of the articles we wrote actually suggested exactly this pedagogy. It's called the pedagogy of discomfort. And we suggested that the uh, schools should, the teachers should begin to abuse white male students uh, to teach them about how they are oppressors and to, to give them the experience of oppression, but we should do it compassionately. And the journal editors, because it's compassionate abuse, it's supposed to be a joke, and the journal editors wrote back and said, we love the idea, but you have to take out not the abuse, you have to take out the compassion. <laughs> because that threatens to recenter the needs of the privileged, to use the technical jargon. And that's actually why I do what I do now, is because I looked down the road. If we think of that moment as a gate and a road, a path runs through that gate, I think that road ends in genocide. And if you're saying that you must use abuse as education and compassion for those you're abusing is not allowed, you're in a, you're in a bad direction. And so I quit my job and dedicated my life to studying and talking about this issue on that day uh, when I got that review. Now, I am always, unfortunately, wary. Not, feminism is a complicated topic. I'm always wary of, of taking feminists as co-belligerents because it's a complicated topic, and there are, there are more types of feminists than there are types of, of animals on the earth, I think. And there are liberal feminists, and there are, there are choice feminists, and there are radical feminists, and there are sex-positive feminists, and there are sex-negative feminists, and they all hate each other. And the problem, though, is at the heart of any feminism, since at least Simone de Beauvoir, is gender criticality. The criticism of the idea that gender roles are somehow connected to the sex underneath them. One is not born but becomes woman, she wrote. And she said, you have two choices. You can become woman on the patriarchy's terms, or you can reject the patriarchy's terms entirely and become a woman independent of them. But unfortunately, biology got wrapped up in the patriarchy's terms. And so what you have is the constructivism, that's a fancy word, the idea that gender is a social construct, but that it somehow can stop when you get down to biological reality. But I don't think that's true. 
I think that, uh, to, again, I have to use jargon, I apologize. I think that, um, let, me, let me explain the jargon. As a man, I have certain chromosomes, I have certain organs, I have certain gametes in particular, sexual cells. That's called primary sex characteristics. As I go through puberty, I develop a masculine body, I grow a beard, I, my shoulders broaden, my hands enlarge. These are called secondary sex characteristics. I think that many of the things that get called gender, not necessarily all, but many, are tertiary, third order sex characteristics. They, they don't just correlate with sex, they derive from sex. And when you're on the construction train, as the feminists are, this is the problem. Eventually, someone will come along and say, you want to maintain biology, but you believe that gender is socially constructed, and therefore, you have no reason to believe in biology, and you're merely doing politics through biology. And so we have to abandon that. And so I am, all, I, I am hopeful to see this awakening and this belligerence against woke from the feminist movement that bills itself as feminism, but I'm wary if they haven't abandoned the constructivism at the heart, because we hear, I don't know if it's an expression in Europe of the slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. Constructivism is always a slippery slope because it believes that the phenomena that we see in the world are constructed by political power and who has access to political power. And so anybody who wants to take the next step merely has to accuse you of being a conservative. And then you have to take the next step or be ignored. Uh, I'd like to insert one more um, aspect of this uh, discussion, which has, I don't think, uh, been mentioned explicitly, and that is that there is an, a very important class aspect to all of this. Both of you mentioned in your talk the, the word bourgeois, but I think the woke ideology is, is in essence, a very bourgeois ideology. Uh, it completely ignores the, 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 the class differences. And um, an author like Mary Harrington writes in her, uh, argues in Feminism in, Against Progress, her, her latest book, that upper middle class women greatly benefit from this type of contemporary feminism, but that the burdens of this, uh, the side effects, the negative sides, fall almost exclusively on the lower class. Like if you are... Uh, uh, a low-class female, and you happen to land in prison, and you're incarcerated with a serial rapist, uh, it's not so much a burden if you belong to the upper class, but if you're on the lower class, you, you, you have to deal with this. And it's not only uh, uh, this aspect, but it's across the whole scope of wokeness, this total ignorance of class difference. Could you maybe comment on that? Yeah, so uh, I discovered this uh, in a very personal way. I, I, was, I spent a lot of time in Italy. We have a little house in Lombardy uh, near Menaggio and uh, living in, in a little village called Codonia. And very often you kind of sit down and you meet with people there. Uh, some of them like me because I'm an ill professori. You know, they, Get, they don't realize that being a professor these days means nothing. You know, every idiot you know, that I know is a professor in, <laughs> in England. Uh, but nevertheless, you get impressed. So he talked to people. And I remember there was a, an election coming up. And uh, so I'm talking to the people in the restaurants. I'm talking to the people in the bars. You know, everybody is for the Lega. It was really, I mean, all the ordinary people were saying Salvini, you know, sort of blah, 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 blah. I go to a party, it's a dinner party, uh, and in the dinner party there are all the, uh, the wealthy people, the lawyers and the doctors and, you know, you know, the big people in the area. And I'm just, I just made a, a, a little remark about the European, European Union. I put my foot in it, and I told them that, you know, in England my family is for Brexit. We were, I'm, I shouldn't be saying this here, but we were very happy with Brexit. Anyway, so this, this guy comes over to me and says, Frank, don't be quiet. Because quiet, these are all payday people. You know, you know, every single one of them vote for the left in, the, in that country. And it really brought it home to me because all the, uh, the middle class and the upper middle class people, the, you know, the sophisticated people, they were on this side of the divide and all the ordinary people were on that side of the divide. And that experience was very interesting for me because then I said, well, actually, where I live in England is the same thing. I live in a, a town called Faversham, and 
complete class divide on who votes for what. I mean, the Brexit phenomenon was a working class phenomenon. They were the ones that were, were for Brexit. It's the same thing. I mean, I'm Hungarian. In Hungary, there's a big difference between Budapest, the capital city, and everywhere else. But even in Budapest, obviously, you know, there's a big kind of divide. And you realize, and this gives me hope, because it basically tells me that you know, ordinary working class people are able to vote for people like us and are able to get attracted to our kinds of ideas because they know that they pay the price for the way that the elites in their society behaves. They are the ones that pay the price for bad schools. They are the people that pay the price for multiculturalism. They are the ones that pay the price for the fact that uh, the, the elites have got their, their kind of globalist focus on the world outside of their country. So, yes, I think that the class dimension is really, really important. And it's all, almost been inverted from what it was in the past. And I think that's a good thing because there are more ordinary working people than there are lawyers and doctors and uh, you know, millionaires. Uh, to start wrapping up this discussion before we turn it to questions, I'd like to finish on, on this uh, hopeful note and uh, more an, an American uh, uh, thing. We see in uh, the US, we see emerging political leaders who are fighting against this uh, ideology. We see Vivek Ramaswamy, who is now an official presidential candidate who makes it a very central point of his campaign. Uh, we see Ron DeSantis in Florida being very successful in the fight against wokeism. In Europe, we see Meloni and we have uh, Viktor Orban, uh, who are also on this uh, speak this language. Um, so what, what you can see is that fighting the woke actually gives a serious pays a serious political dividend. And I'm often a bit taken aback that the mainstream political parties continue to go against the people in, in advancing these very woke causes. So how, how, how do we explain this, this enormous divide when they could, should, could get rewarded by actually following what the people want? Well, I think that the answer is quite simple. It's frequently corruption, um, but there's also fear. It's very difficult with your political career. It seems, at least, very difficult to maintain your political career, to survive the struggle session that you will get if you stand up against this. Some people can. Ron DeSantis does. Ron DeSantis has in Florida. And if you look at his example, I told people at dinner last night, and people in Europe often don't know this, in 2018, Ron DeSantis was was elected by the narrowest of margins, a few thousand votes, is 50 point less than 0.1 percent, very close of the vote. And then in 2022, he was reelected with over 10 percent. He had a huge shift to people voting for him, a very, very big shift. And so there are these big political dividends to pay, and I think people should be looking at this. But the fact of the matter is the previous question and this question are the same question. And Marxism was always a ripoff. It was always a way, at least after Lenin got a hold of it, for the bourgeois themselves, set themselves up as the vanguard who would usher through the revolution while they robbed a country blind. It was always this way. You have to be cushy to believe these ideas. That's an American slang term. You must be rich and comfortable. We call them champagne socialists in the US very frequently. You have to be rich and comfortable. And what we have is a situation where the hyper elite have rigged the system so that other people in the hyper elite have been told the following fatalistic concept. There is a change coming in this world. You can do nothing to stop it. And if you help us, you'll be rewarded. If you resist us, you'll be destroyed. And there are entities that have the power to have made that offer. I named in my remarks earlier the World Economic Forum. I know they make this offer. I know this directly. They make this offer. The banks, for example, uh, BlackRock, which is headed by Larry Fink, but when you team together with the Vanguard Group and you team together with State Street Capital, just the three largest, not the other, they control, they own or manage, I should say, the assets for 40 percent of the entire S&P 500. Imagine owning or having management control over 40% of the economy and what you could make other people do. For example, you could convince them that if they go against you, you will be destroyed. But if you go with them, however unpopular it is, they can help you. Of course, this is the logic of a mafia. 
This is the logic of a cartel. This is not the logic of a free system, a free country, a free West, or a free enterprise, free market. This is the exact opposite of that logic. But I think that that's the answer. The reason woke is so bourgeois is because it's to the benefit of the bourgeois, and they're using it to entrench their own power, maybe knowing that it's a bit of a desperate grab, knowing that if it goes bad, the pitchforks and the torches, not literally, might come out. Don't go violent. They'll beat you if you go violent. So I think that this, these two questions are the same question. I think that the reason we see, besides just typical political cowardice, not realizing the lesson that Ron DeSantis should have taught not just American politicians but the world, but also uh, if we set aside those fears, not just that fear, we have a logic where there is actually not the freedom that we think we have, that we've already lost much of that freedom, and that is what's causing the bourgeois elements to uh, entrench their power this way. Thank you very much. Now uh, we are on a, a very tight schedule and we are uh, very curious uh, to hear from you. So uh, we're going to turn it to questions. I will uh, uh, check a few questions. May I ask you not to give your vision of the cosmos, but kindly limit your question to maximum two sentences so that we can also field other questions and then we will submit to the speakers and then we will wrap it up. Okay, so who's the first question? Mr. Rantane. Yes, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the concentration of wealth to, you know, to usurious uh, investment bankers, hedge funds and uh, mega corporations who incidentally are some of the biggest perpetuators of this phenomenon. So, as such, having stated these facts, you know, shouldn't we see this whole phenomenon as a really destructive, atomizing distraction that is perpetuated by those who benefit from the current broken economic system to the detriment of the vast majority? Thank you. Okay, distraction. Other questions, please? I will. Uh, anybody else? Yes, gentlemen down there. Uh, my question is to both of the speakers. Um, given that woke 10 years ago was more of a French movement and now it has become almost mainstream, has the woke movement perhaps exposed the fragility of our system and our institutions? Okay. One last question, maybe? Yes, uh, Ms. Matthias. Uh, hi. So I think that you were, James, were one of the first person that I've heard talking publicly about the 2030 agenda, which is a topic that is not very uh, known, at least in Portugal. So yes, I wear uh, a mark on my computer and everyone asks why I have a, a cross uh, against that. Because as you mentioned, it talks about uh, sustainable, sustainability, uh, goals, things that, that look like. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more and let us know more things about the background of this agenda? Thank you. So in some sense, almost all three questions are the same question again. So this is very convenient. Um, so with regard to the United Nations Agenda 2030 goals, uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which extended the Millennium Development Goals, which were birthed out of the same consortiums that came up with the concept of ESG, which started in 2003 at the United Nations by a man named James Gifford, whose intention was to figure out how to use invested pension capital to do impact investing through the banks. Uh, what you have in those goals, one of the goals is, I mean, you have things that sound very sustainable, like life under the sea life on land. Those sound like environmental things. You also have things like ending all hunger, which seems a little hard to do by 2030. Ending all poverty, which also seems hard to do. But then you have gender equality as one of them. The inclusive goals of the woke are embedded into those Agenda 2030 goals. Now, I bring up the ESG, and this is where these large financial institutions come in, having adopted that program from the United Nations. The S in ESG stands for social and is short for social justice. 
And it is defined in terms of meeting those goals that are embedded in the 17 sustainable development goals dedicated to culture and society. So the woke is designed to be operated through a social program that's being forced on corporations so that they will behave in this way. And it is, I think, partly a distraction, as you asked, for the people so that we don't pay attention to the financial abuse. But on the other hand, it's also an incredible control mechanism, this level of it being a bourgeois phenomenon. Who has time to learn all this? Who has time and energy to learn all their pronouns and everybody at the office's pronouns? You have a million things to do. You have a real life to live. You have a family. The only people who can do this are people who are very, very, very socially privileged. And so what they do is they set up a system that's very expensive to impl implement, that creates a very expensive regulatory control system, and then they rig the financial markets so that you can't possibly avoid it. And so what you do is you end up controlling the ability to build businesses and build capital as to whether or not you're in compliance with this goal, with these goals. If you're not woke, you don't have your S, you don't have your ESG, you're not achieving the sustainable development agenda. And so it's all part and parcel. The, this is actually the top-down part that Professor referred to in his remarks. This is the top-down structure. But if you bother to read Klaus Schwab, if you can stay awake, in his book, a Great Narrative for a Better Future, he explains that there is also a bottom-up component, which is SDG 5, quality education for all. No, four, sorry, it's five is gender equality. I almost have them memorized. Four is quality education for all, but it means global citizenship education that incorporates all of these goals. And he says we will educate the youth to demand that the corporations and that the, that the civil society follows these dictates where our public-private partnerships cannot succeed. And then in the third point, he says, we'll also rewrite the social contract. So the spirit of Rousseau haunts Europe still. And we will rewrite the social contract so that everybody has to abide by this. And so it's distraction, yes, but it's also a mechanism of control much more. Can I just uh, allow one more minute? The MEP will wrap up the whole conversation. So if you have one minute reaction. Well, yeah, well, actually, you should. You should read Schwab's book because he's the author of both The New Normal and The Idea of the Great Reset. And the important thing about that is it brings together two ideologies, one which we talked about woke, but the other one is sustainability. And the idea of sustainability comes across as beautiful and soft and everything else, but what it does is it kind of creates a, a synthesis, an ideological synthesis that is used to leg legitimate the rule of capital in the 21st century. And I think people really need to read that. There's one thing that we haven't discussed that, that is also in the document that they put out, which is what I call socialization in reverse. So what James called, you know, sort of the bottom-up stuff, what the bottom-up stuff basically says is that the youth are going to have to re-educate the old, and the youth will somehow, because they're influenced much more by these ideologies, they're going to have to create this revolution and almost basically sweep the old generations aside because they are very much lost. They have become too much attached with the past. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Cardi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, to our important guests. And um, I would like to speak in Italian, in my uh, mother language, because uh, in Italy is not so well known this issue. And I would like to spread this, this speech on the social media. Che uh, cos'è il walk? I nostri ospiti oggi ce l'hanno eh, spiegato bene, però il termine, soprattutto in Italia, è ancora ignoto ai più. E lo, spesso lo si scambia per il nome di una razza aliena di guerre stellari. Ma per chi è walk, ormai è, il, il termine è diventato un insulto. Il walk che nega se stesso. Per il militante di sinistra il walk non esiste. Eh, per chi lo avversa è il nome di una rivoluzione in corso. In Italia la confusione regna sovrana. 
Eppure la cancel culture, la work revolution e il politically correct sono termini inglesi entrati anche nel lessico giornalistico italiano. Sono tre aspetti di una rivoluzione culturale in corso negli Stati Uniti, nel Regno Unito. E inizia a far capolino, sempre in maniera più prepotente, anche in Europa. La work revolution prende il nome del, dallo slang afroamericano e si è diffusa soprattutto col Black Lives Matter, soprattutto dal 2015 in poi. E stay walk significa letteralmente stai in allerta, anche se ultimamente è diventata la definizione del più generico consapevole del problema dell'ingiustizia, eccetera. Stare in allerta era d'obbligo per quei neri che uscivano dal loro quartiere e che rischiavano di fare una brutta fine per mano dei bianchi ai tempi della segregazione. Dopo mezzo secolo dalla definitiva fine della segregazione, per molti neri il ghetto dà ancora un senso di protezione nei confronti del mondo esterno e ogni episodio di brutalità della polizia contro un nero disarmato è indicato come prova di un razzismo persistente. Ma nelle università più costose d'America sono gli studenti, spesso bianchi, e gli intellettuali che sentono il dovere di restare in allerta per scovare ogni traccia di razzismo nel discorso pubblico. Un gesto, una parola, un tono di voce possono sembrare innocui, ma secondo i walk sono minacce velate o segni di un razzismo residuo. Al movimento dei Black Lives Matter eh, si è poi sovrapposto quello del Me Too. La, propos- la protesta del Me Too nel 2017 è stata però por- di portata universale nelle sue conseguenze. Ha creato una nuova ideologia femminista, ha aggiunto alla causa razziale anche quella sessista. La società americana occidentale in generale viene accusata, oltre che di razzismo sistemico, anche di maschilismo tossico, come è stato detto. Il maschio è colpevole a prescindere. Il politically correct, che va di moda sin dagli anni 90, è il codice che definisce ciò che per un walk è corretto o scorretto. E il razzismo contro cui lottano non è solo quello contro i neri, ma anche contro tutti coloro che sono visti come gli oppressi di ieri e di oggi, gli omosessuali, le donne, gli immigrati, i membri delle minoranze etniche e religiose, i transgender, gli animali, <ride> eh, difesi dagli esseri umani però. Ma le categorie si estendono di continuo e i modi e i tempi difficilmente sono prevedibili. La cancel culture eh, è il modo in cui i woke esercitano la giustizia ed è un eufemismo per definire la nuova forma di linciaggio. Il colpevole viene bandito dopo una campagna di odio in rete nelle università in pubblica piazza, dopo il boicottaggio, il ritiro di ogni invito e infine anche il licenziamento. Se l'ingiustizia è un simbolo, come una statua, si chiede la sua rimozione. Se è un film, si chiede la sua cancellazione. Se è un testo, non deve più essere venduto o messo in prestito nelle biblioteche. E così di seguito, fino a un reset completo del passato. Non si tratta di un fenomeno troppo di nicchia. In America, negli ultimi sei anni, si contano più di 500 docenti segnalati per aver espresso opinioni controcorrente. Tre quarti di essi hanno subito sanzioni. Il trend è in forte crescita. La maggior parte dei docenti è stato contestato per discorsi che riguardano la questione razziale, anche se erano solo pareri personali. In Italia il fenomeno è meno diffuso, eh, ma già nel mio piccolo conosco un professore dell'Università di Milano, Marco Bassani, che è stato sospeso un mese senza stipendio, solo per aver rilasciato nella sua pagina personale di Facebook un meme ironico su su Kamala Harris, giudicato sessista dagli studenti più politicisti. Un mese di sospensione senza stipendio per un meme nonostante lo abbia rimosso dopo poche ore. Nel Regno Unito la rivoluzione woke è attecchita più che altrove in Europa, la maggioranza degli studenti inizia a essere contraria alla libertà di espressione in tutte le sue forme. Un sondaggio dell'estate scorsa, condotto dal Higher Education Policy Institute fra universitari, rileva che vogliono vivere in un safe space, uno spazio sicuro in cui la loro sensibilità non sia urtata. Non si può fare un dibattito sul razzismo o sessismo perché sono temi di per sé inaccettabili. Si devono eliminare dalle biblioteche e ritirare dal commercio i libri che hanno contenuti offensivi. Si devono licenziare i docenti colpevoli di fare discorsi offensivi. E non è solo un moto studentesco. La rivoluzione woke è nelle piazze, dove abbatte i monumenti personaggi che ritiene compromessi con il razzismo. Basti pensare alle statue di Cristoforo Colombo abbattute o decapitate, e questa è una grave ferita per insomma, un'italiana, perché lo scopritore italiano dell'America è considerato all'origine del genocidio indio. Vittime di questa nuova iconoclastia sono stati antischiavisti come Lincoln e persino 
illuministi, filosofi come David eh, Hume eh, o Gandhi, Churchill. Eh, a Milano la statua del grande giornalista Indro Montanelli è stata imbrattata con la vernice rosa perché c'è la diceria che ha alimentato lui stesso eh, che avesse comprato una schiava etiope durante la guerra fascista per la conquista dell'Abissinia. La Walk Revolution eh, riguarda anche altri settori importanti nella società. I media, prima di tutto, il cinema, l'arte, sempre più anche il mondo delle grandi aziende. Non puoi più candidare un film agli Oscar se non è sufficientemente rappresentativo delle minoranze. Nel soggetto, nella sceneggiatura, nel cast, persino nel personale e nella produzione. Le multinazionali dell'informatica Big Tech sono a trazione Walk. Eh, già basti l'esempio di Netflix, eh, l'abbiamo già detto più volte, eh, attentissima a non, eh, non dire niente di scorretto. Eppure basta che una battuta di troppo scappi sui transgender e parte una lotta senza quartiere per settimane. Eh, Barry Weiss, la scrittrice, giornalista ebrea, membro quindi di una minoranza, e che ha rassegnato le dimissioni dal New York Times perché subiva mobbing dai suoi colleghi walk e non era difesa dai superiori. La sua è diventata la battaglia di tutte le vittime della cancel culture, vittime di sinistra soprattutto, e purate da chi è più puro. Sulla rivista conservatrice Commentary, la Wise ha scritto un articolo manifesto che descrive non solo le caratteristiche della Walk Revolution, ma porta anche numerosi esempi che permettono di comprendere quanto il fenomeno sia infido e pervasivo. In una terza elementare... Si insegna ai bambini bianchi di liberarsi e pentirsi del loro privilegio. In un'altra scuola prestigiosa si ritiene che un insegnante bianco non possa tenere lezione ai bambini neri. Non si distingue nemmeno l'intenzionalità, anche un fraintendimento può portare a una condanna. Un operaio che scrocchia le dita in modo sospetto viene licenziato in tronco. Eh, un professore di linguistica che insegna l'uso del like eh, agli studenti cinesi viene tacciato di razzismo perché il like in cinese ha un suono simile a quello dell'ormai impronunciabile parola latina con cui si identificavano gli afroamericani. Sono storie surreali, angosciose, che ricordano i regimi totalitari di Stalin e Mao, più che la terra delle libertà all'Occidente. Eh, ma in Italia? Beh, nel mio paese ci sono dei sintomi che non devono essere trascurati, eh, come quelli che ho citato prima. In due licei è andata in scena una protesta studentesca per cause sedicenti femministe. In un caso gli studenti maschi sono entrati in aula vestiti in gonna per denunciare la masconalità tossica del corpo docente. Un secondo liceo è stato invece occupato perché la direzione è stata accusata di aver negato a uno studente di accedere all'identità trans. Ieri sera abbiamo avuto una scena, citavo il caso dell'Università di Pisa, dove sono stati gli studenti di sinistra hanno provato ad abolire il bagno per i maschi e per le femmine perché se ne doveva fare uno solo in nome no, appunto di questa ideologia woke. Sono pretesti, piccoli o grandi, per portare la rivoluzione woke anche in Italia, ma anche perché l'Italia è ancora ferma alla guerra precedente, quella degli antifascisti in servizio permanente contro i presunti fascisti. Da quando è stato nominato il governo eh, di centrodestra abbiamo sempre più manifestazioni antifasciste in piazza e fior di presidi che invitano gli studenti a resistere a quello che giudicano come un nuovo squadrismo. E siamo ancora fermi a quegli anni, per questo la nuova sinistra non attecchisce, eh, è ancora soffocata dalla, eh, dalla vecchia ideologia che non intende però morire. Il passaggio dalla vecchia resistenza alla nuova rivoluzione WOC sarà rapido e inavvertito. La nuova sinistra non è molto distante dalla logica della lotta di classe. Se il fenomeno è cresciuto negli USA, che non sono mai stati comunisti, lo dobbiamo all'apporto culturale anche dell'Italia, perché il marxismo è sempre più di moda nelle università americane ed è filtrato proprio dallo studio di Gramsci, il filosofo italiano più volte e più influente nella cultura americana da vent'anni a questa parte. Come possiamo combattere questa rivoluzione? Perché sia chiaro va combattuta con ogni mezzo. Non possiamo fa farlo con le armi della censura o della repressione, perché quelle sono le loro armi. La nostra è una battaglia di libertà innanzitutto. È la libertà a partire da quella di espressione che la rivoluzione woke vuole sopprimere. Quindi dobbiamo tornare alla difesa dei nostri valori fondamentali. Libertà di espressione, libertà di insegnamento... Eh, libertà di stampa, libertà di produrre arte senza compromessi, non ci sono se o ma. La libertà di espressione serve a proteggere chi dice cose sgradite, non chi è in linea col sentire comune che non avrebbe bisogno di protezione alcuna. L'Italia non è immune da questa lotta, dobbiamo stare sempre in allerta. 
E com'è che si dice? Stay awake, not walk. All right, so we'll leave it uh, here. There's a, a cocktail reception, as always. I guess everybody's thirsty, maybe also hungry, I don't know. <laughs>